We are here at Lipscomb University in their beautiful video suite on the Made It in Music podcast with my dear friend, amazing producer, writer, Blake Bollinger. Thanks for having me, Seth. Thanks for being on the show. I'm excited. Awesome. Heard the show many times. I'm excited to get to be on this side of things. Do you have a favorite episode? Well, I haven't listened to them all, but uh, the one with Shane McAnally was really profound. Definitely gives me something to shoot for. It, well, that's that was one of my favorites, too. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for listening to it. Thank you for knowing what it is in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> I've spread the, the word. It's good stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, man, you have such a great story. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you've kind of followed the breadcrumbs, so to speak, the mm -hmm. proverbial breadcrumbs that have led you to where you are today, um, having been able to be in the studio with artists like Blake Shelton and working with uh, people like Scott Hendricks and uh, many, many more and producing many of your own great records as well. So we're going to talk all about that, but I want to rewind all the way back to the beginning. Okay. What was the first moment where music impacted you and you knew that you had to make it a career? Mm, a career. I mean, the first impact I remember, I uh, was five and I wanted, the song was the Chariots of Fire theme song. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> and I just had to play that on piano and I didn't even have a piano. I just knew for whatever reason, that melody was just something that got stuck in my soul. And I was like, man, I want to take piano lessons because I want to learn how to play Chariots of Fire theme song. So my mom and her masterful skill, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the way to describe it is, but she got a piano that cost three times as much. She got it down because they had mislabeled the price on the piano. And she was like, well, we'll take it for that price. And like, well, that's more than we paid for. I was like, well, if you want to make a sale or not. So walked out the door with a greatly reduced piano cost and uh, sat down and couldn't figure it out on my own. So I got a piano teacher and uh, that was, that was my goal. I, I learned a few, I don't even, you know, it was five at the time. So I don't remember what I learned, but that was, I remember my hands not being big enough to hit the octave. So I had to da -da 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 -da, use both hands, da -da, you know, hit the low <laughs> note. But that was the first song that really kind of caught, I caught the music bug with. Yeah. And um, so that made you, that, that, that kind of lit the spark, so to speak what, what did you do? What, like, what did you do with that? Obviously you're five years old, so you're not starting a career probably that early. Not I thinking about imagine. a career at that point, <laughs> but yeah, I just really fell in love with playing piano. That was kind of my first introduction to music and, uh, I took lessons and I think I progressed pretty well. You know, I was doing the state level competitions and doing well in those. So I, at the time I really just kind of had a vision of, well, I play piano, so I could either be like a pianist or I could teach music. I didn't really realize that there's literally thousands of other career paths inside of music. But at the time, I was just growing in piano and cla it was all classical, all the Bach, Beethoven, Mozart kind of things. And um, I had a period around maybe 12 or 13 where I kind of got tired of it. And my parents were like, hey, you have a lot of potential in this. If you do it for one more year and you really go for it for one more year and then you want to quit, that's fine. We'll let you quit. But you have to work hard at it for one more year. Mm -hmm. And I really think that was a huge turning point for me because I was ready to quit then. And I didn't want to do that extra year. I didn't want to. I was ready to be done. But in the middle of that year, something switched, light bulb moment kind of thing where I went from have to practice to get to practice. Mm -hmm. And for a few years after that, you know, until I discovered girls and cars and all that stuff, I was just kind of insatiable with, with practice. Like I'd get home from school and I couldn't wait to practice piano. And, and that was probably my biggest period of growth was, uh, you know, when that switch flipped of going, this is something I have to do to something I love and I'm, I'm seeing results, getting better at it. Uh, yeah, that was just kind of a fun, I think probably grew more in that year to two year period, um, than probably all of the lessons and time up mm. to that point. Wow. So shout out to your parents. For... Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tell people that I actually taught piano lessons and guitar lessons in high school to make some money. And, you know, some of the parents would be in that same boat of, do I sure. let them quit? I was like, you know, sometimes find a time period, set that if they want to quit at the end of that, fine. But forcing them to have a goal and reach that goal. Um, yeah, you can, you can find that moment that yeah. triggers you going, I love this. So. so how did you start on your journey to becoming a producer songwriter from all that? You know, I think I was learning to be a producer well before I ever had any idea that I was learning to be a producer. I was obsessed with sounds. I've just always been a big 
student of sound. And, you know, some of that is, as I grew in high school and college, man, I, how do they get that snare sound? How do they achieve that sound? You know, it grew into that, but I just always had, even early on, I think an early music teacher identified what was normal to me was, they were like, that's, he has, you know, I don't have perfect pitch by any means, but he noticed some things that were like, man, that's, that's unique. Most kids in the class don't have that. They're not identifying sounds and seeing this pitch and you can hit and match that pitch. And I actually started singing and my parents put me in uh, the Texas boys choir. Mm. Really, really cool. It was actually a fantastic wow. experience. We, we toured the country. I became part of their tour choir wow. and we spent six weeks in a bus traveling, you know, the country performing in churches or cathedrals. And we got to sing for the president and do all kinds of really kind of experiences that for me at the time were just kind of normal. But looking back, I mean, that's not very many third graders are gone for six weeks, you know, (laughs) singing in the Crystal Cathedral in California and Carnegie Hall in New York. So it was special. And, you know, obviously there's a nerdy element to it with the choir robes and the coffee filters and yeah. <laughs> it wasn't literal coffee filters, but you know, <laughs> the look of the, of the yes. choir robe. Yes. Um, but that really gave me a love for not only travel, but just seeing people react to music. I think mm-hmm. that is, like I said, I didn't know that I was studying that at the time, but seeing what worked, seeing what made people react to a song, I was getting to see that every night. And some nights we'd get a standing ovation. Some nights we wouldn't. And why didn't we? And figuring that out, what makes a concert great? I think that was all training to well, what makes a song great. Because a concert is a collection of songs, obviously. And sure. what inside of that moment has to be special to really wrap somebody's brain and heart around the song. Sure. So did you kind of know all throughout the process that being a producer or writer was the way you were going to go or did how, how did that kind of like what was the trail of breadcrumbs so to speak that co- sort of led you to that discovery well truth be told i honestly didn't even know that that was an option i knew there was producers and i knew there were songwriters but for some reason i grew up and i guess hopefully people listening to this can tell other people cuz if i had known back at the time that you don't have to be the artist performing your own songs to make a living. I just literally didn't know that. I I came to Nashville and I thought people that, you know, Tim McGraw is obviously writing all of Tim McGraw songs. That's not the case. He may have written some, but a lot of them are written by, you know, the world's best songwriters. Mm. And so when I would drive up and down Music Row, I'd see all these music companies, but I literally just, I thought they were all studios or something. I had no idea that publishing companies and songwriters and studios, the way that Music Row and Nashville kind of works, the whole lifeblood of it, I that was just foreign to me. So even when I came to Nashville 10 years ago, I thought I had to be an artist and I dabbled in the artist career for a second and real quickly found out that, you know, I'm, I'm an okay singer, but there's people that are so much better at that. And what I really loved was the, the creation process, the creative process of creating a song, making that song, bring it to life. And then not only on a writing level, but then on a production level, taking it to another place. That was what I really fell in love with. And the idea that I got to be at home and not travel every weekend was very interesting to me that I, I had done that a bunch and, and loved that aspect of it. But to know that that wasn't the only way was kind of, I felt like I was late to the party discovering that, mm. but that was also kind of eye opening too. It's like, man, I can have a career. I can make a living working from my house or on music row five days a week, and then can also coach my kid's soccer game mm. and not be gone all the time was, was kind of eye opening and, and a great discovery. Yeah. That's fantastic. So why you said you've been in Nashville for 10 years? Yeah, it was 10 years, uh, probably back in October. So just okay. over 10 years. Why did you originally make the move to Nashville? It's an interesting story. I had, uh, been in a band in high school that, that had actually truly formed in middle school. Mm -hmm. I was asked by my youth pastor to help out. He knew I played piano. And at the time I was only doing classical piano. So I had never improvised or read a chord chart or any of those things. He just knew that I played piano and he would stand up and sing songs on the guitar and invited me to join his band. And uh, that was a learning curve for me, you know, learning the G chord. (laughs) You can actually, if you play G A D instead of G B D it's an inversion and just kind of using my ear 
to go, well, that sounds kind of cool. And maybe what if I had this note or this inversion? That was just kind of a real world experience to improvising and coming up with my own things that weren't locked in on paper, like playing what's on the page exactly. So that was really kind of, I don't, he probably just wanted to have somebody else up there to help him sing. But for me, that was a huge turning point for me of, you know, that led to going, well, this is fun. Let's get somebody else. Let's get a drummer. And then we added a drummer and then, well, if you have a drummer, you gotta have a bass player. And that kind of spun off into my own band. Um, very famous Christian band called Destination Known, mm. as opposed to Destination Unknown. Very clever. Thank Very you. Clever. Yeah, I think we have been uh, listed on the top ten worst Christian band names <laughs> list, or <laughs> should have been at least. But uh, no, we we really had a great time. We traveled a lot, did a lot of worship events, a lot of concerts. You know, that kind of led to different iterations of the band. And uh, one of the guys that was kind of co-fronted the band with me is still in, he's in Nashville doing great stuff on the TV film level. So, you know, at the time pro tools wasn't on a laptop. It was like, you had to have a big old computer and most of them were just the big professional level things. And when the one finally came out that you could have on your own personal computer, we just literally discovered pro tools together and learned in hotel rooms, just trying new things and recording you know, using pillows for for baffles for electric guitar amps, just kind of in hotel rooms at camps. Um, that was kind of where I learned production was just figuring it out and just sort of jumping in and doing it. But yeah, so that band led to uh, you know we had a great run. We did that through high school, through uh, through college, and then whenever it came time to realize that. I've met a girl, I want to get married, uh, you know, is the band going to be part of that? And we tried to do that for a minute, but there was a point in my life where I said, man, I've, I've got to move to Houston and pursue this girl and get married. And she was in med school at the time. We had both met at Baylor and went there for four years. And I had actually led like the chapel band and we played, you know, most weekends I was gone. Uh, I discovered real quickly that you can't be pre-med and then also be gone playing shows all weekend, <laughs> get back at 4 a.m. and be attentive at 8 a.m. biology sure. class. That didn't work out too well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so quickly realized medicine's not for me. It's easier to marry a doctor than to be a doctor. <laughs> so a uh, little, little tidbit there. But <laughs> yeah. So I moved uh, to Houston to follow my wife. Uh, she was girlfriend at the time, asked her to marry me. I stayed in Houston and I took a job working as like a worship director at a church okay. for a couple of years. And, you know, we had bought a house. We planned on staying in Houston and I was singing some worship songs that I'd written, mostly other people's worship songs, Mm -hmm. enjoying that aspect, but not really feeling truly fulfilled musically in that, uh, in that capacity. So when she graduated med school and was looking for a place to do residency, the, the smart, comfortable thing to do would have been to stay in Houston because she had already gotten acceptance into UT Houston med school and I had a great job and we owned a house and we had a dog and, you know, it was a very kind of leap of faith thing to kind of push her to go, well, what about Vanderbilt? Maybe we should apply there. And long story short, she was able to get into Vanderbilt for her, uh, for her residency. So that was what brought us to Nashville. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the first time in my life of not knowing anybody. You know, I'd always had friends, just grew up with the same people. And she was, 80, 90 hours a week at the hospital that first year. So that was kind of a a growth period for me of coming to Nashville, realizing the talent level here that I either need to quit, go home, <laughs> or need to get better. And that was a big uh, eye-opening experience for me. And humbling, too. You yeah. kind of think you're good at something where you are, and then sure. you come to where the big boys are, and and girls, of course, yeah. uh, uh, that where the where the the cream of the crop is if you're going to compete with that, you you have to, for most people, it's kind of an eye opening, Oh crap experience. I got to get better. So that was definitely mine that first year. And, and I I guess was, was it sort of to be in the epicenter of all that? Like, was that a conscious, like, was that a surprise to you when you came? Like, were you expecting to be the, you know, all of a sudden the big fish in a small pond or. I don't think I expected to be that quickly, but I definitely, you know, I think we probably all think our skill set is sure. greater than it really is. And it was. It was humbling and, frankly, it just a great lesson to learn sure. of just how much talent is here and in other music cities and really around the world. But there's such a concentration of that here that, you know, but it really is a family-oriented place of 
the, you know, you can, you and I are, are genuine friends now and that we met through other people and we're rooting for you when you, sure. something happens for you or vice versa. I think we really are rooting for each other. So there is yeah. a collaborative collegial feeling about this town that, uh, you know, it just takes time to get in the flow of yeah. meeting people. And but it I can think, be hard to. Yeah. It, absolutely. It, it, it really is. And it doesn't happen quickly. I mean, there's obviously exceptions to that rule. I wrote with a guy this week that I think he's been in town three or four months before he got his publishing deal and a month later got a record deal. And those are the exceptions to the rule. Uh, and he is fantastically, fantastically talented, but most of, you know, people call it a 10 year town and I, and that's certainly been the experience for me. Yeah. And so when you first moved here, I mean, you didn't really know anybody in the industry. So how did you go about overcoming that hurdle? It's a great question. I, I didn't know very many people. And I think, if you can ha- if you can know people that certainly is a help can kind of just speed the process but you know i had to just kind of throw myself out there i you know i didn't really know going to this show is that going to be profitable or go to this writers round is that going to be profitable i have no idea so i just for the first 6 months my wife was working all the time i didn't know anyone so i would just go out and spend the 10 dollar cover if you had to to get into a show and grab a drink and try to strike up a conversation. And, and that was awkward at times. It was times where, you know, I'd come home and just go like, Oh, what am I doing here? This is brutal. You know? And it was on some yeah. level to not have that support structure that I had, but you know, it didn't take long for there to be one or two people. I mean, there was a, I think I was a little depressed in October and my mom was like, there's this thing called men's fraternity at this church you're going. Sure. <laughs> and I don't have that kind of relationship with my mom where she can tell me, you know, I'm, I'm an adult. I do what I want. But at the same time, she was so intent about that, that I really think you need this. I really think you need to go meet some people. And, you know, I thought it was a cool God thing that I walked in and there was a guy at a table and it said Sony music on his hat. And of mm-hmm. course I just could have sat at any table. So I went and sat at his table and we be, ended up becoming, uh, fantastic friends. He's one of my best friends, but he was just so encouraging early on that he introduced me to this person and introduced me to this person. And early on would just be like, this guy, man, he's got such a great ear. He's got, you know, blah, blah, blah. These talents that probably I didn't necessarily have at the time, but he, he saw potential there and he introduced me to people as if I was already there. And that really, you know, knowing someone and having someone vouch for you can certainly made, makes a huge difference. So there's Chad uh, Schultz is the guy I'm talking about who works at Warner Brothers now. And then uh, another friend of mine who's a fantastic artist in his own right, um, Sam Tenez. Yeah, the yeah. two guys, those were probably the the most influential people in just meeting them. I mean, the first time I wrote with Sam, I had literally never co-written a song in my entire life. I was so nervous. This guy has a publishing deal. Has a, he has a record deal. Like, what are we going to, what if I have nothing? And yeah. I've learned that most of the time you have nothing and you just come up with something together. But he was so encouraging about the way our, the first song went that it's like, man, let's do another one. And a couple songs later, um, his publisher at the time, uh, had said, man, who's this other guy you're writing these songs with? We love these. We'd love to meet him. And, and that was curb, uh, curb records, curb music publishing, and didn't end up signing a deal there, but they plugged me into a lot of rights, a lot of camps, a lot of just opportunities, um, to kind of, develop that relationship. And just the idea of like, man, writing a song Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sometimes on the weekend, you can do that as a real job. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, And that just sort of helped, even though I didn't sign there, that was a good year of just learning, man. Right. You, we'd write something back then that, oh, this is a smash. And yeah. looking back now, I think we had good instincts, but we just didn't have the knowledge and the 10,000 hours and the hundred songs plus that you've got to write to realize what the difference in an okay song and a good song is. And then even then what's the difference in a great song and a hit song. And yeah, uh, that was, that was kind of my first foot in the door with a, with a company here. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I, d- I didn't realize that you and Sam were like that. That was the story. So yeah. That's, that's really awesome. We've had, we've had Sam on the podcast and, Sam Tenez is a good friend of mine, and um, yeah, that's so cool. I always love love when those things kind of intersect and overlap because it's such a small town. It really is, yeah, and you just never know who knows who, and yeah. that's one of the many reasons why you should always be nice to people. Exactly. Is everybody knows each other here, and you can't really uh, get away with much. So. Yeah, no, no, totally. And so once you kind of started those, whatever, planted the seeds of the relationships, mm-hmm. what were some of the key skills that you maybe had to develop, um, that were able to kind of get you the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, what were the things that you had to like get pro at? 
Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. I think um, one of the things that really helped me that I had to learn was showing up with an idea, you know, uh, taking the time before or the night before or taking a weekend and stacking up four or five ideas. And I learned quickly that a lot of times having an idea doesn't necessarily mean you'll write that idea, but it breaks the ice and it gets the creative juices flowing where literally just yesterday morning I had a a songwriting session where I I was like, man, I need to come up with something. I had a few track vibe things, but I just sat down with the guitar and started playing this thing. And this idea popped out and I went ahead and threw it out there to him. I was like, man, I got this little thing. What do you think of this? And had a little hook and that was about it. And he's like, Oh, I love that. And it, it literally fast forwarded us probably two hours in the process of which chords do we play? Do we yeah. want to write a tempo <laughs> song or whatnot? So having an idea that's worth something is, I think that's a real difference maker in guys that have a, a faster trajectory. And, you know, people talk like, how was your ride with so-and-so? And yeah. man, they've got great ideas. And the opposite is true. When people come in and, like, man, you got any ideas? And, and oh, I don't know, I've got nothing. You can still come up with something, but it's a lot harder. And I've certainly been that guy. Like, I got much, I ain't got much today. But sure. um, having at least not just not just a hook, not just an idea, but a melody and like you might have a cool title, but how do you get to that title in a creative way? I think having at least some of that mapped out, you may use it, you may not use it, but there's something about walking in with an idea that's at least half-baked really helps people want to write with you again. Yeah, and, and I think it shows, well, yes, it's like you said, they want to write with you again because you're proactive. Like they mm-hmm. know that you're there because you want to add value. Mm-hmm even if you don't use the idea. Yeah. And man, that's, that's one of the biggest things that I, I personally need to get better at, like just stockpiling those ideas. Mm-hmm. And I know like you're great at it. Jesse Frazier is amazing at it. Um, he talked about how he, you know, sits on, on his laptop just over the weekend, mm-hmm. just coming up with stuff. Do you have a system for like, like every Friday is your track building day or what, mm-hmm. what how, how do you generally go about I wish I had every Friday to be that, but a lot of times it is kind of that time in between dropping off my kids and we start writing at 1030 or 11. You know, there's always something that didn't get used, but maybe not something that I'm super excited about. So I try to have something and to keep it fresh for myself, you know, I don't want to get too nerdy on certain plugins and that kind of thing, but I try to find at least a sound to anchor something. And, you know, there's always new creative options with arcade made by output. I mean, they're always putting out new sounds and just spending time on there on splice or something, just finding some sound to go, Ooh, that's cool. And I try to just wait for that kind of visceral reaction of like, Ooh, that's cool. And if I don't have that, it's like, "Eh, it's kind of cool. It's whatever. I just keep going until I have that reaction. And whether that, that could be a groove, that could be a, just, a sound could be a little guitar riff that I'm either playing or finding. I wait until I have that, uh, that, like I said, that physical reaction of like, Oh, Oh, I love that. And then I allow myself to go, all right, I'm going to spend 30 minutes. Cause if you, if you let yourself, you could spend four hours developing (laughs) something that never goes anywhere. So in order to keep it light, because you know, you, you may have something set and you think this is cool, but if you spent too much time recording guitars and drums and bass and all that on it, someone might walk in and go, Ooh, let's change the tempo or let's change the key. So I try to keep it where it's pretty modifiable, Mm -hmm. where it has some sort of vibe that is fresh and feels cool. And that also is pretty easily modifiable for key, whether that's keeping it all in the MIDI realm versus actual audio realm. Um, I try to have three or four things like that, that people can, you know, if someone walks in with an idea, that's fantastic. Sure. We we can start from scratch, but we can also go, man, you got any track ideas? And, I, and, and the days that I can say yes, that usually goes well. We usually end up using one of those. But I do find it interesting that no matter how deep I have one idea or 10 ideas, it's almost, oh, I would say 95% of the time, what we end up writing that day is the last thing I came up with right before the write. There's just something about the day and the energy in the room or whatever vibe is out there. It just seems to be whatever I started playing last, the yeah. latest idea right before the write is almost always what we end up using for the writing session that wow, day. Wow, that's fascinating. And no listener left behind. He was talking about Splice. Splice is an amazing source for 
if you just are like stale on your sound, Splice is amazing. I think it's just Splice.com. Yeah. Um, and you ta- you mentioned Arcade by Output. I'm not as familiar with that one, but again, it's mm-hmm. just um, just endless supplies of new sounds, right? It is, yeah. And really, just whatever you use, finding a tool that isn't getting stale to you. You know, they're like, oh, this is the same thing I always use. <laughs> Trying to keep it fresh and finding something that inspires me. And if I'm inspired, I'm probably much more likely to create something great with whoever I'm riding with. Mm. That's good. So did you have any creative strategies when you were getting into it, you were breaking in for differentiating yourself from other writer producers? That's a great question. I, you know, that's a struggle all the time because, you know, there are people that are on the side that say treat demos like demos and treat masters like masters. Cause obviously there's a huge time differential there of some guys get away with demos that sound frankly, from a sonic perspective, they don't sound good, but they have a vibe to it. I'm certainly a guy that leans more on the, like make everything sound like a record, but I've had to adapt back somewhere in the middle because if you do that, then you will be behind and turning in songs a month later. And there's definitely something I've found that there's an energy and something about getting the song out the day of. And I'm not anywhere close to getting that done all the time, but I've had a few friends that are very successful in this business really challenge me that like, man, whatever you do, you got to get it done the day of. Cause then you just, you're not clogged up with that, that weight of I've got to finish this tomorrow. Um, if you can start fresh without a, a, you know, Oh, I think one time in five years have I had no demos to finish. And that was the yeah. beginning of this year. And it was the best feeling ever. I was like, I don't know what to do with myself. Well, man, I, again, that's another thing for me. I am, I, I so wish I could do that. I, I've not figured out how to do that. It's a day. challenge. And I've certainly gotten, I think, getting fast at whatever DAW you're working with, Pro Tools, Logic, whatever it is, getting fast with that. And then also just realizing like what people are listening for. I mean, in different genres, it's different, but most of the time in the country sphere, which is where I'm focused mainly, they want to hear a cool groove. They want to hear a great lyric. They want to hear a fresh melody. And if you can kind of accomplish those things with sort of, and put like one little cherry on top with some quirky instrument or a cool harmony, a lot of times that sort of halfway version of a song ends up catching somebody ear, somebody's ear more than a full blown record quality thing. And cause I've, I've had experiences where, you know, a song may be perfect for an artist, but they will hear, Oh, well I would never use a banjo on that song. Oh, and in so my brain is going, of well, it. just take the banjo off. But in their perspective, they're just hearing it as a whole unit. Yeah, so if you can yeah. kind of paint the picture without over painting the picture, uh, I think, especially for other producers too. It, sure. If you're trying to write a song that they can take and enhance, you need to give them somewhere to go, yeah. you know, take it to the 5,000 foot level and they can take it to the 10,000 foot level. If you, if you've already gone there, sometimes, sometimes that's what you need to do. There's certain producers that want to hear a really fleshed out song, but um, that's helped my speed is getting to a place where I can just kind of go, man, this is cool. It's got a groove. It's got a good vocal. It's got a, a little something extra and obviously the song has to be good, but yeah. you can kind of get it to that point. feels like that's kind of uh, reacting more. And there's also something about the turnaround, whether it's the next day or a few days later that I don't know, I think people kind of just lose interest in, in the today's society. Like a song that you wrote two weeks ago, even if it's good, you're not going to care about as much as the song you wrote that day or the day, you so know, two days the, ago. So the artist might just move on. Yeah, they it. just kind of mentally on. move on. So there's something about a quick turnaround that sort of, there's just this swell. I think of it as like a wave. There's just, the bigger you can get the wave of finishing a song that you love, finishing the demo quickly, getting everybody excited about it, it just seems to kind of make a difference in whether that's a song they yeah. choose for their record. And so with that, are you, and I'll, I'll cause I'm, I'm nerding out a little bit really for selfish reasons because <laughs> I, this is, this is a goal of mine. I want to get better at it. Sure. Are you spending time, you know, editing the vocal and making sure that the vocal takes are comped and good, or is it kind of like, Hey, it just let, let the flaws be there and put auto. The vocal is probably something I spend more time on than maybe I should, or at least, you know, compared to some guys that literally just one take, that's good. You, you got it done. I'll usually do three or four takes. And f- honestly, most of the time we work with great singers, sure. gratefully. So it's not hard to get a good vocal, but, um, if their tone and, and 
pocket, meaning like where they put the phrase on the beat. Obviously, you know that, but for the for everybody else, if they can kind of have that pretty darn close, three or four passes is usually all I need to kind of go, ooh, I like this one, or how about mix it with this one? And honestly, I'll usually leave like auto-tune, sort of a pitch correction Stay thing on, and then I'll only fix the spots that maybe either that gets wrong and it reads wrong and it thinks it's the note above or below and kind of fixing those graphically rather than doing everything yeah. super scientific. It, it's, I've just gotten my vocal process down to about 30 minutes of wow. um, recording. The, that's after recording the vocal. Sure. Well, once you record the vocal, getting something that is pitchable 30 to 45 Perfect. minutes and with, with harmonies usually under an hour tuned and ready to go. That's That's been something that has taken me a lot of time to get faster at, but I think that's allowed me to kind of keep a faster pace. Yeah. That's so good, man. Well, um, I'll, I'll get out of the weeds on that. I know <laughs> okay. this, this was a, se- a little bit of a selfish rabbit trail. Well, we trail. can certainly go down Hopefully that Hopefully helpful for our, our listeners as well. Um, what are some of your biggest accomplishments so far, like things that you might be most proud of in, in your music career? Sure. Um, gosh, that's a good question. I, I'm so quick to forget about the things that have happened that I'm like, oh, yeah, we did that. I forgot about that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I've gotten to be a part of some really cool records. I, I grew up listening to Hootie and the Blowfish. And to get to fast forward, to get to go right with Darius at his house. Yeah. And once again, a, a case of us having some songs, some song ideas well formed. You know, Darius has written for a long time, so he wants to have a. You know, what do you have? Do you have an idea? I don't. He doesn't want to start necessarily from scratch, so he wants to take an idea and put his stamp on it, and and, and obviously make it better and make it him. But uh, yeah, I mean, what, I, yeah, what are you bringing to the? What table? do you bring yeah, to the table? Yeah. So I remember <laughs> stressing out so bad the night before we went and wrote with him. The the guy that I was writing with, we honestly didn't have much at the sure. time and he wanted to go out and hit the hot tub and just go out and I was like bro <laughs> we don't have anything right now we have a few titles but we have to sit down and I we actually got in a fight I had to step away because I <laughs> one of the more heated moments uh, I'm a pretty easy to get along with guy but yeah, it all worked say, out what is mad Blake actually I, well I had to go take a shower and just calm down <laughs> and he had to take a minute and we came back together and we we hugged it out and we you know we came up with three ideas that um, next day when we showed up, Darius was, you know, he's such a big personality on stage. But when we got there, he was watching Sports Center. I was like, what you got? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, here we go. And thankfully, we played him three ideas. And he was like, well, let's write all three of them. And we finished all three songs in two hours. So about 45 <laughs> minutes, uh, a little over that uh, Man, per song. For people listening to that, they're probably like mind blown. How physically, how do you even do that? Like, how much of it did you have kind of fleshed out? We had a, at least a you know a verse and a chorus concept. It wasn't solidified, but it was at least something that it wasn't mumbling. You know, I think that's a technique in songwriting is you may not have the lyric, but you kind of put vowels and sounds that you think is going to be something similar to what the lyric's going to sure. be. And, and honestly, that helps you find the lyric a lot of times by just sort of mumbling through it. But we had what we thought was at least a solid verse and chorus for three ideas. Mm. And that way, you know, second verse was at least we had an idea of, we didn't, hadn't written that yet, but we knew at least conceptually what that would be. And sometimes you can write yourself into a corner of you've said everything in the first verse and the chorus and well, what the heck do we say in the second sure. verse? So that can be a big stalling point. So we at least had a, a concept for verse two and maybe a few, a few lines of like, here's kind of what we're thinking for verse two. And that was where he was really able to jump in and put his stamp on that. And then also kind of reshape the whole thing. Sure. But yeah, without that, it, it would have been a much slower process. But I think at that point, if, when yeah. you have the verse and chorus and at least an idea for the second verse, you're kind of over the hill where it's most of the time is pretty easy to, to finish. Yeah, that's good. Man, that's still blowing my mind. Three songs in, in two hours. <laughs> yeah, and gratefully, he recorded one of them, and uh, it was never a single, but he did open his show with it for wow. about two years. So that was a big moment for me to get to, you know, I had a backstage pass, and I took my wife, and we went to a show in Atlanta and got to hang out with him and his whole band, and just his whole crew was so welcoming and, uh, you know, just really felt like a, a rock star moment of like, you know, <laughs> being sure. a huge fan of his and listening, being influenced by his music and the band's music when I was a, a kid, getting to hang out with him backstage and him thanking me for my talents and being there was very, very surreal. And, you know, obviously I've gotten to have 
other moments like that, but that was kind of the first. Sure. And, uh, you know, getting to hear him play that song and being down in the front, dancing around. Yeah. I, I think I was just probably just filming the whole thing just yeah, going yeah. what is happening right now yeah, but seeing the 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 15,000 people that were there into this song you know that was really just such a picture of like the power of music you know sure. just what was coming up with two guys in a hotel room stressing out going what are we going to come up with <laughs> to seeing 15,000 people dancing to it and singing along to it was just such a mind blowing, but it is also addicting too. It's like, yeah, yeah. I want more of this, you know? Yeah. And I think that was a good motivator to keep going. Sure. So you've reached this level. You're at the Darius Rucker show, seeing, seeing him perform your song, mm -hmm. 15,000 people. You've talked a little bit about, and we've talked off air a little bit about this, of this idea of just kind of following the breadcrumbs and seeing mm -hmm. where it leads. Um, what is that what does that mean to you or really to anybody who's kind of aspiring to do what what you do mm -hmm. well i somebody told me that a long time ago uh, i just you know follow the breadcrumbs and i didn't really i mean i understood what they meant but i didn't really realize how true that was going to be kind of for my own journey cuz you know there's a lot of opportunities when you kind of reach at least a certain level of kind of being in the game there's well you, there's a, a zillion people you could write with there is opportunities to go do this or this or this. And, you know, you can certainly be distracted by all that and you can spin your wheels. But then again, I see other people that are just so they're just waiting for the perfect opportunity mm -hmm. and they end up missing, you know, my journey has been, you know, <laughs> the God bless the broken road from here to here to here to here to here to here to here <laughs> and back again. And, you know, it's just, you never know, like I never knew to use the Sam Tenez example, yeah. I never knew I had asked a guy, I was trying to still do the artist thing at the time and had asked a guy for a list of guitar players and literally called through the first list of the guitar players. None of them could do it, but somebody on the first list gave me a list of another sure. group of guitar players. And I think Sam was second or third on that list. And he happened to have a week off from his band. And, you know, I was like, man, I need a guitar player. He's like, cool, I'll do it. And just pursuing that led to him going, man, you're a cool guy, fun hang. Uh, like, why don't we write a song sometime? I never would have gotten into the co-writing thing or I would have eventually, but you know, if I hadn't made that leap and just gone, well, you know, invested in him as a person and a friendship that led to us writing songs. And, you know, one of the, we, we joke about like a side hustle, you know, we all yeah. kind of have different things like songwriting and producing is, is my main thing, but I found some, you know, uh, to use the word success or some, some money to be made sure. in, I've been gotten to do programming for a lot of major artists in the last couple of years. And that honestly just came from doing demos that people liked. People will hear, you know, spending that extra hour to kind of add something special to a demo to make it set, stand apart and going, well, yeah, this is good, but what if I tried this? What if I tried this? I think kind of that extra attention to detail perked enough ears around town to go, man, who's doing that? I like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the first people to kind of do that, um, was Michael Knox who produces Jason Aldean. And, you know, he hasn't brought a new person into his, the way he produces Jason Aldean records is the same studio, the same band. Cause it, you know, he has a formula for success and it's sure. worked yeah. in a massive way. So for him to bring on a new person into that mix was kind of, yeah, abnormal and yeah. and also pretty cool opportunity well, it but speaks highly of you and what you're doing so yeah and that all came about from just demos that i had written with or songs i had written with people that he write at his company at peer music and just kind of going man who if you can get that reaction of not only who wrote this but man who did that track yeah that can help lead to more opportunities if it just sounds a little different a little quirkier a, a little better um that led to him letting me do programming on the last three Jason Aldean records. It's and amazing. just kind of from doing that, that's led to working with other great artists like Tyler Rich and Tyler Farr and uh, most recently Blake Shelton. Um, that came from just the demo that I had done for an artist uh, named Trey Landon that he had, that he's producing. He hit me up and, that and Blake is producing, uh, not Blake. Um, Scott Hendricks okay. is producing. Yeah, Trey yeah. Landon is on Warner. I know I'm jumping around on names, but Trey Landon's on Warner. Scott Hendricks is producing him as well as Blake Shelton. Okay. Um, and the song that we wrote, I kind of gave the, the the extra love on that demo. And he was like, man, can you send me some of those 
stems is what they call them, like the parts of the tracks that from the demo to include into the, sure. the, the master that they had cut. And he was like, man, feel free to send me those. But if you want to try anything else, try that, see what else you can come up with. So yeah. I thought, man, that's, that's definitely not one of those opportunities you want to phone in. And I right. spent kind of cleared the calendar for a day or so and, and just tried things, just went through sound sets and tried things. And until I felt confident that, I don't know if he's going to like this, but I like it. Sure. And that's kind of my gauge. It's like, yeah, yeah. dude, can I look myself in the mirror and go, I'm proud of this. I like this. Yeah. And I got to a point with that and sent it to him. And, you know, you're kind of on pins and needles. And an hour later, he shot back a, a text. It was like, loving everything you did. This is great. This is perfect. And I sort of thought, man, that's great. I nailed that. Um, I didn't know there was going to be any opportunity beyond that. Um, and then about a week later, he called me and was like, man, have you ever played on a session before and, and truthfully yes but it's been like years and on a sure. demo session not anything major and he said well we have uh, I've got an opportunity in January you know I, he's kind of had his group of guys that he's used but he's like man you know I 15 years ago I brought in a guy that nobody else was working with and had him do string arrangements and that worked out well and now I use him on everything and everybody other guys are using him on everything so you know maybe that could be be our relationship. And he's like, I'm not promising anything, you know, you got to nail it, but yeah. that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And just to hear someone like Scott for who, for me is, you know, an, an idol in a lot of ways, he's produced over a hundred number one songs. And just also someone I look at as not only great at what they do, but he's also a great family guy. And he has a lot of balance in his life that I <laughs> aspire to. Sure. Um, so just on all those levels, really super excited about getting to work with him, he, having him, say to me things like, man, I haven't heard somebody's ear, you know, I haven't heard an ear like yours in a long time. And the stuff wow. that you add, it's just like, okay, you're obviously talking about somebody else because <laughs> you couldn't possibly, it was just very foreign and very wow. humbling for him off of what I did on one song to have him say, man, Blake Shelton's recording January 9th and 10th. I want you to be there. And uh, for me to get to not only play piano and organ on that record, but to do beats and cool sounds and vocal effects, like just to get to kind of work side by side with him on, on Blake's record. I'm not a, not co-producing, but in a programming capacity yeah, has been just such a thrill. I mean, that was to get to play with near Z and all these other cats that are at the top of their game and get to play, you know, I've always watched them and I've used sure. them on different projects, but to get to play on the session with them and it just brought back all those nostalgic yeah. memories of playing with a band and That's it was just amazing. very exciting. Yeah. It was very wow. cool. Very, very cool. So kind of back to the breadcrumb analogy, what do I do if I can't see the next breadcrumb? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, they're always out there, you know, you have to just kind of, I think we can all get so drawn to the next big thing that the mundane days in between of, man, work on your craft, learn a new program, write a song by yourself. If there aren't opportunities, I think a lot, at least the way I used to be is, well, I'm only going to write a song when I'm inspired. Mm -hmm. And that led to writing <laughs> maybe one or two songs a month. And so the idea of writing a song or two every day was just, totally foreign to me. But in, in anything, if you really dedicate yourself to it, you can work that muscle just like working out. You can get used to it and come up with fresh ideas every day. And it certainly didn't come overnight, but you know, on those days that there wasn't a breadcrumb, so to speak of something to follow, just really growing in your craft for when that next opportunity arises mm -hmm. Um, that you're ready for it. Cause I've, you know, I look back at some of the opportunities that I've had over time and, you know, with a certain artist or with a certain whoever. And I, looking back now, I, at the time I thought I was ready, but I really wasn't ready with my skill set. And, you know, it, it went okay. And some of those led to another right. But, you know, if I had a time machine and could go back with the skill set I have now and bring that to those opportunities, I think it would have had a different. Uh, a different result sure. of being, you know, I could have been so-and-so's producer, you know, if I had yeah. really brought what I know now. So, you know, obviously we're always growing and you don't want to look backwards, but just, you know, taking those times of like, man, I have nothing cool to do today. Well, don't go watch TV, go spend a couple hours on YouTube, learning a new program or getting a couple ideas ready for, you may have nobody to write with on your calendar, but when you do having four or five things that they're excited about is, is worth its weight in gold. That's awesome. And, um, kind of a similar follow-up question. 
what do I do if I see two breadcrumbs? Mm. How do I how do I choose? <laughs> that's tough. Well, which one's bigger? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's really tough. I mean, I, I I guess my first reaction was like find a way to do both. You know, because most of the time you can obviously that's not always possible. Sure. And if one is clearly better opportunity than do that, but you just never know, man. I remember I, I'm grateful to get to be co-producing Rodney Atkins right now. And amazing. I never would have gotten that opportunity if a friend of mine uh, hadn't said, man, I'm writing with this, I'm writing with Rodney. Do you want to ride with him? And of course I said, sure. And I remember thinking, man, we, it was a tough ride. We didn't really get much and we tried to get back on it and we thought we were going to finish it and something happened and we didn't even finish. So I remember being so bummed by the second ride with this major artist didn't, you know, we didn't finish the song. So I'm like thinking of it as a failure, but a month later, Rodney calls me. He's like, man, I loved what you were doing with the track in that room. So, you know, you can't look at the things as they are exclusively. I, like if I just looked at that one moment, I was like, well, we didn't get a song. So that's, at the time I was thinking that's a failure. But the truth is he saw something in what I was doing with the track and just kind of messing with different ideas that he was like, man, I'd love to bring you in on, and try you out on a song that we need kind of a fresh sonic perspective on. So, you know, that was obviously a great opportunity, but taking something that <laughs> squeezing the lemon, you know, sure. for a kind of idea is that I thought that was a something, a total bomb. I thought that had not gone well, but still in that moment, I had brought my A game, I guess, on some level. And he saw that and, you know, and then when you get that opportunity, you really got to go all in and, and treat it like it's, it could be the big one. You know, yeah, I think, yeah. um, just not, not phoning in anything or doing it halfway. Sure. Well, one of the sort of breadcrumbs for you has been going out on, you know, the weekend with, with artists on these bus mm -hmm. runs as, as, as we call them, um, is is that something that you're you're doing a lot more of nowadays? Like, has it has it always been a thing? Um, maybe maybe yeah. speak speak to what it is in the first place. Sure. Uh, obviously, artists travel on tour buses, and um, not 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 all of them. But some of them are in a van and trailer, hoping to be in a bus. Um, but a bus run is basically when you go out with the artist. You show up where they get picked up or where they park in a Kroger parking lot or Home Depot parking lot and jump on the bus with them and you go out for the weekend. And most artists have at least a couple hours a day available to write a song. And uh, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they have a radio interview or something. And you may very well be sitting on the bus just <laughs> coming up with something, hoping that they may get to come back. But the idea is that after you wake up and have some breakfast, you write songs for a couple hours and then you go to the show with them that night. And I found that to be incredibly valuable because you know you listen to someone's record and you get a concept you get you get some idea of what their show is like what their artistry is like but nothing really helps you learn that as as well as seeing their live seeing performance the show. Well, so we'll, I, we'll dive i i do want to dive a little bit deeper into cool. bus runs yeah. we're going to do that in a bonus segment you can just check that out at madeitinmusic.com and uh, look in the episodes page you'll see it on the blake uh, Bollinger interview episode, Perfect. but just how do we, how do we set up a bus run to be a successful bus run? We'll talk about that. Cool. So, um, as we're closing out, I would love to transition us into my favorite part of the show. Okay. The lightning round. Lightning round. Let's talk about your biggest studio or production mishap that you've been involved in. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Uh, there's been several, uh, sadly, but probably one of the funnier ones that, that worked out is I remember being an intern at a studio right out of college, and uh, it was a, oh gosh, an AKG 414, and not that that matters, but it's gold on one side and black on the other side, and and you sing into one side, very obviously, and not the other side, Um and we had set up the mic for a vocal group and, you know, an hour in, they were like, man, I just, this just doesn't sound right. I, you know, I can't, 
can't quite, you know, it's just not feeling right. I don't know. And, and I think myself and, and the other guy that were working on this together real quickly just had that deer in the headlights look when we realized we had set up the microphone that they were paying $80 an hour at the studio backwards. <laughs> and, uh, we literally did kind of one of those moves where you're like, Oh, what's that? And you know, <laughs> like, Oh, what's that? And then we flipped the mic around and like, oh yeah, we, we, we made a few adjustments acting like we, oh, well, you know, we're professional. We know what we're doing. <laughs> and then we went back into the control room and they immediately sang into the mic the way it was supposed to be. And oh my gosh, we, we were, we were geniuses in this person's mind. So yes. <laughs> make sure the mic is pointed at the, the right, correct, correct direction. direction. Yeah. That was, that was a fail. I love it. Uh, favorite plugin. Ooh, favorite plugin. Um, well, the name alone makes it awesome decapitator uh it's a distortion plug-in uh made by sound toys that uh, i pretty much put on everything on everything literally yeah almost it can it can add a little something something on, on just about everything okay uh favorite instrument uh, my favorite instrument would probably be my Gibson Hummingbird. I have a, a 1970 Gibson Hummingbird that was my dad's, and uh, he – I don't know that he ever gave it to me as much as I took it from him and said thank you, uh, but he uh, – you know, he bought it for $300 from a local music store in Texas, and uh, I mean, it's – it's infinitely valuable to me now, but it, you know, it's worth several thousands of dollars now, but it's just has a, it just has a rich history, lots of nicks and dings, but, uh, he learned guitar on that, taught me guitar on that. So, uh, that's pretty much the main instrument I ride on. Okay. Gibson Hummingbird. Good, mm -hmm. good choice. Uh, favorite thing to do to unplug from music. Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, probably get out of town. I have a hard time, even when I'm in my own, really anywhere in Nashville, not thinking about music 24 seven. My wife can attest to that, but, um, you know, I don't get to as often as, as I want to, but anytime I can go to the mountains or to the ocean, there's something about the, uh, the bigness, if that's a word, um, of the mountains and the ocean that just sort of makes me feel small, makes me feel, I feel like I'm closer to God in those moments. And, uh, it just gives me perspective. It's good. I love it. Uh, is there anyone in music that you always wanted to meet or work with that you finally got to work with? Mm, 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 mm. Well, I've mentioned a few of those people. Um, let's see if I can talk about somebody else. Uh, I mean, Jason Aldean was a, was a really, yeah, I've been a fan of his because I came from sort of a rock background and obviously he's in the country genre, but has like a rock vibe to it. So, you know, as I was discovering country music, he was a, an influence for me. And so to get to just hang with him in the studio and talk hunting, even though I don't know much about hunting, try to act like I know <laughs> a little bit. He, I think I carried on about 20 minutes of hunting conversation with him thinking that I knew what I was talking about. So that was a win. But yeah, that was That's definitely awesome. an important person for me to get to spend time with. Very cool. Well, uh, Blake, it's been a pleasure having you on the Made It Music podcast. Thank you for having me, Seth. I'm excited to be here. It's been amazing. So um, check out the show notes, madeitmusic.com, and we are going to be bringing you the deep dive on how to set up a bus run to be successful. All right. Perfect. So, thanks again, Blake. Thank you. Hey, what's up? Thanks for hanging out on this YouTube video with us. In case you didn't know, this is from the Made It Music podcast season too. We have a ton of awesome guests that come on the show, all music business professionals to share their knowledge and experience with you. So if you want to subscribe to not miss any future episodes, hit that subscribe button on YouTube and you'll be notified about all of them. And in case you didn't know, we do a deep dive for every episode where we go really in depth on a certain topic from each podcast episode. So sign up right here to get free unlimited access to all of those deep dives from our podcast. And if you want to watch another Made It in Music podcast video, click here.